such a good feeling to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling you're growing inside. And when you wake up ready to say, I think I'll make a snappy new day, it's such a good feeling, a very good feeling, the feeling you know you're alive. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to United Church of Christ in Boxborough. I'm Reverend Cindy Worthington Berry, and no matter who you are or where you are on the journey, you are welcome here. Whether you are with us in person or online, live or later, please uh, feel connected to us today one way or another. And if you'd like more information about UCC Boxborough, please visit our website where you can sign up for The Flash, our weekly email newsletter. And if you're with us for the first time today, welcome. We are an open and affirming congregation, fully welcoming people of all sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. We have Zoom Deacon Nancy hosting folks on Zoom this morning. Good morning, Nancy, and everybody on Zoom and Facebook. You can chat with Nancy on Zoom in the chat box, and Nancy's also gonna post a link to the digital bulletin. You'll have um, hymn lyrics and other things you need right on the screen on, um, on Zoom today, but the bulletin also has announcements about important things going on in the life of UCC Boxborough. So our worship service today is inspired by the work of Fred Rogers, better known as Mr. Rogers. I don't really know why I chose this for today. I just needed like his peaceful, loving presence. Uh, I'm old enough that my childhood was shaped by watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood on PBS. Younger folks might be familiar with the spin-off, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Now, Mr. Rogers has been broadcast in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. That leaves out, though, a lot of the world. So even if you live in a place where you couldn't watch Mr. Rogers, or even if you did live in a place where you could watch Mr. Rogers and you just never did, I am hoping still this service will have something for you because his messages of caring, I think, are indeed needed by all. So how many of you in the room have seen Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? You can also raise your hand online. Yes, yeah, a lot of us have. Do you remember how we started the show? Tell me how. Walk through the door, he would take off his suit jacket, he would put on a red sweater, and, uh, and then he would change his shoes, right? For years, the sweaters were made by Fred's mom. She made him one every Christmas throughout her life. In the first season, the sweaters had buttons, but buttoning up the buttons was a little tricky, especially when you're also singing. And on one episode, Fred buttoned the buttons wrong. His crew wanted to retape it, but he wouldn't let them. He wanted to show children that everybody makes mistakes. But the buttons also bumped up against the mic, so in the second season, they swapped the buttons out for zippers. But it was still stressful for the crew, really worried that the zipper was gonna get snagged while he was, while he was singing, so they waxed the zippers and held their breath until that part of the show had, was, was over. Once Fred's mom wasn't making the sweaters anymore, it was hard to find replacements, especially on the show's slim budget. They ended up buying white sweaters and dyeing them vivid colors that would pop on television, but the area around the zipper didn't absorb the dye, so they had to color it in with permanent marker. But why go to all the trouble with the sweaters? One of the answers is ritual. As humans, we find patterns reassuring and comforting. That's why they show up so much in our religious practices. In a busy life and a chaotic world, it can settle us to go through familiar, repetitive motions. Rituals can also help, help draw a line. Mr. Rogers changing out of a suit jacket you'd wear to work into a comfy sweater for home says that the work day is over and now it's time for family and friends and neighbors. So by starting every show with the sweater and the shoes and the song, Fred told his audience, this is our time. You know this is safe space. I am 
focused on you now. His consistent actions communicated more powerfully those ideas than words ever could. Now, I'm saying all this right now because at this moment in our worship service every week, it's the equivalent of the sweater and the shoe changing. This is when we try to let go of all the tasks and the plans and the busyness of our lives and enter into a time of just being with each other and with God. So as you listen to the sound of the bowl, picture yourself swapping the jacket of productivity for the sweater of presence. Imagine taking off the tight shoes of keeping up and sliding on slippers of comfort and hear God's voice singing you to this time and place. Morning. Good morning. I'm Phyllis, the student minister here at UCCB. I'm so delighted you're here this morning. Please join with me this morning in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin and which is also on the screen. Your response is, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> Hi, neighbor. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. The neighborhood of our whole faith community. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. The neighborhood of all of our brothers and sisters and non-conforming people and siblings. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. The neighborhood of God's whole creation. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Let's worship together in the neighborhood of God. Please join me this morning in singing Hymn number 32 in the New Century Hymnal, God of the Sparrow. We're going to be singing verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. Not a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do that later. <laughs> our centering prayer with a bit of silence. In the quiet, I invite you to think about your neighborhood. Define that however you like, the street you live on, the floor of your apartment building, your development, or city block. If you're here in the sanctuary, you could consider the church's neighborhood, those who live and work around this building, whatever you choose, picture that neighborhood, its gifts and its challenges 
as we come together in prayer. Let us pray. God of love, sometimes our neighbors are a treasure. They care for our cats when we're on vacation and invite us over for a barbecue. Sometimes our neighbors bring us a little stress, playing loud music at all hours or constantly borrowing things they don't return or worse. And yet your challenge to us is the same, God, to love those neighbors, to send out through our neighborhoods a spirit of peace and compassion, to see ourselves as being intricately connected to our neighbors, so that what impacts one of us impacts us all. Help us to not only bring such love to our neighborhoods, God, the whole world as our neighborhood. Fill it with love. This was what was taught to us by Jesus, who also taught us to pray, saying, Our ever-loving God, who art in heaven. Mr. Rogers said, peace, like love or like hope, is an action that one can take, something that can be done, not just something that might arrive. So let's practice peace today, making it an active and an intentional choice as we share God's peace with one another this morning. May these not be empty words and gestures, but a promise of how we will live in the world. If you're online, you might offer peace with each other in the chat box. If you're here, with a bow, a wave, or a high five, and then we'll sing our song of celebration. God's peace be with you. second chapter of Matthew verses 34 through 40. It is one of the most well-known passages of scripture. Leaders around Jesus are asking him lots of trick questions, trying to get him to say something that will get him into bad trouble. But Jesus doesn't fall for that. In this passage, he quotes the Hebrew scriptures twice. One is a passage from Leviticus the other is the Shema, the famous Jewish prayer from Deuteronomy. Here, Jesus' description of how we should live. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourselves. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These are our sacred stories. May we have the vision and the wisdom to live them. Children of all ages are invited to lean in for a word for all ages. So uh, this past week, Paul, that's my spouse, took a, a picture of me. We've been uh, snapping a lot. Our family has gotten really into Snapchat since two of our boys don't live with us anymore and don't talk to us and never come home and really don't love us anymore. But they are, <laughs> but they are willing to have a snap streak. So uh, we do that. But um, Paul takes pictures of me when I'm not paying attention. Uh, you notice he's not here today. Um, so he, he took a picture of me and I saw it. And my total reaction was like, oh, look. Uh, and it was a very familiar feeling. Sometimes I have to listen to a recording of one of these worship services. Oh my God, that woman is so irritating. I don't know how you can stand listening to her voice. That's really, like when I hear my own voice, I just... <sighs> Do you ever react like that when you see a picture of yourself or, or hear your voice or read something you, you wrote? Is it just me? No, okay, we've got some, we have some, we have some feelings. Did you know we are breaking a commandment when we do that? Jesus said, love God, Love your neighbor as yourself. Which means we have to love ourselves. Would we go to a neighbor's picture, right? Would, would we hear like a, a recording of our neighbor and go, oh, you sound terrible. I, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that, right? When we do it to ourselves, we're breaking the greatest commandment. Mr. Rogers knew this. He said, you can't really love someone else unless you really love yourself first. Now, the good thing is Mr. Rogers and Jesus are all about forgiveness and trying again. So it doesn't matter how many times we've done that in the past, seen the pictures of ourselves or heard our voices and gone, Bleh, and, ah. and I better never see the recording of me going black and ah this morning. I wouldn't recover from that. So we need, in order to follow the commandment, we need to be able to love ourselves. Right? We've all, we're all agreeing with Jesus on that? Okay, good. That side is anyway. But sometimes it helps if somebody else tells us they love us first. It's just a weird thing. In loving ourselves, sometimes it helps if somebody else tells us they love us Mr. Rogers said, I like you just the way you are. I like you just the way you are. Stared into that camera, so it felt like he was staring right into your soul, and said, I like you just the way you are. Not what you look like, not what you wear, not what you do, just you, uniquely you. I like you just the way you are. Okay, now that you've listened to me say that I like you just the way you are over and over again, maybe it will be just a little bit easier for you to love yourself. So I'm going to invite you, if you're willing, to close your eyes, or just you can also just look down if that's more comfortable. Picture yourself in your mind. And in a minute, I'm going to invite you to say, I love you, and then state your name. I love you. Don't say state your name. Say your actual name. Okay? Ready? All right. Here we go. All together. I love you, Cindy. Good job. Now maybe we're ready to love our neighbors. Amen.
your second reading this morning is just a brief quote from Fred Rogers, one of about a million wise statements this man made. He wrote, as human beings, our job in life is to help people realize how rare and valuable each one of us really is, that each of us has something that no one else has or ever will have, something inside that is unique to all time. It's our job to encourage each other to discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. So this week I learned that uh, Fred Rogers said a little prayer before every show. You may know he was a, a Presbyterian minister, but I, I think this was more just who Fred was. He wanted God to somehow come through the content of his show, so he prayed. Let some word that is heard be thine, meaning God. I think that's a good prayer for preachers, too. So this morning, I once again borrow Fred's words. God of love, let some word that is heard be thine. As you can imagine, this week, I, I watched a few episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I was checking out some of my memories since it's been over 12 years since I even had reruns going on while my kids were watching it. I could not get over how slow everything was. Mr. Rogers spoke slowly. He moved slowly. You see how hard this was for me? There were pauses everywhere. Uh, be because I was in like research mode, I kind of wanted to play the video on double or triple speed. I thought that I, <laughs> Nicolette does not like that idea. It actually uh, made me feel kind of itchy to watch it in real time. But after a few minutes, my body adjusted to his pace. I felt more calm and more peaceful, more able to roll with his meandering voice. And I could be wrong, but I bet that experience this week in my 50s similar to my experience when I was five. I imagine my mom trying to keep up with all my chatter and movement all day long, finally seeing it was time for Mr. Rogers and inviting me to take a seat in front of the television. My mom got 30 minutes of peace while I got a little practice regulating my bouncy little self. And all that time, Mr. Rogers was setting that peaceful pace he was also imparting powerful wisdom. It is tempting to just reel off a bunch of Mr. Rogers quotes this morning because he had so much insight about parenting, childhood, imagination, embracing differences, the power of play. I could go on and on, but I'm going to focus on just a few themes from Mr. Rogers' work. Um, I, do, I think Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was like a series on Jesus's great commandment constantly showing us how to love God, love each other, and love ourselves. So the first thing I have in mind is how Mr. Rogers spoke and demonstrated the values of difference. He was particularly good at helping his audience to practice loving someone different from themselves. Most famously in 1969, Fred set up a kiddie swimming pool on the set of Mr. Rogers and soaked his feet right alongside the feet of Officer Clemens, a black police officer on the show. And of course, this was at a time when community pools across the country were still racially segregated and at a time when white people were often cruelly and violently maintaining that segregation. So it was a powerful visual to see a white man and a black man with their pants rolled up, splashing their feet side by side. But Fred also knew that divisions between people aren't, often aren't as obvious as race. Our neighborhoods are full of people who do things differently, see things differently, experience 
things differently. Fred wasn't interested in going for the lowest common denominator or smoothing over the differences. He said, probably much slower than I will actually say it, we're all on a journey, each one of us, and if we can be sensitive to the person who happens to be our neighbor, if we can be sensitive to the person who happens to be our neighbor, that to me is the greatest challenge as well as the greatest pleasure. He liked to quote Mary Lou Kanaki, a Benedictine uh, nun who just died last month. She said, there isn't anyone you couldn't love once you've heard their story. There isn't anyone you couldn't love once you've heard their story. That seems like such a powerful echo of Jesus's ministry for me, where he would stand with those society judged and see the preciousness within. It wasn't about tolerance. It was about seeing them as beloved children of God. Okay, one of my personally favorite things about Mr. Rogers is his comfort with feelings, with having and showing strong emotions. He said, when we can talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting, and less scary. I just think that's really true. Fred told his listeners about being picked on when he was a child. He was really honest about the experiences he went through and how sometimes being picked on made him want to cry, it made him cry, and sometimes how it made him really angry. Fred modeled vulnerability in a powerful way. He said, people have said don't cry to other people for years and years, and all it has ever meant is I'm too uncomfortable when you show your feelings, so don't cry. Fred said, I'd rather have them say, go ahead and cry. Now, of course, I think it's particularly helpful to have this coming from a man, especially in times and places where the notion that boys don't cry still exists. Fred knew that if we stuff our feelings, they will come out somehow, like fear that comes out as anger, so let's deal with them together. In fact, dealing with things together was a big theme for Fred. Even today, some adults focus on protecting kids from hard things in the world. Instead, Fred sought to find child-appropriate ways to talk about things like divorce, war, illness, adoption, and death. He said, uh, anything that's human is mentionable, and anything that's mentionable can be made more manageable. Anything that's human is mentionable, and anything that is mentionable can be made more manageable. He knew kids are always absorbing what's going on around them, even if nobody will tell them what's going on. And as much as he gave children a sense that they were okay, he was coaching parents with how to talk to their kids to help us all look for the heroes, like Fred's own mom told him. Now, Fred died in 2003 at 75 years old. I think we could particularly use him now with all the big things humans are faced with. I imagine how he might have helped us practice talking with each other about climate change and ongoing racism and vaccines and masks. I feel like somehow he would have helped us remember we are neighbors and do a better job living out Jesus' great commandment. But maybe that's a cop-out. Thinking that if only Mr. Rogers here, were here, things would be better. Fred had terms like hero and saint attached to him. He didn't like it, and his own wife said it was a bad idea. It made it seem like the things that Fred did were unattainable to us mere mortals. Mr. Rogers shared that he had to work to temper his anger. He was known to be a bit controlling on the set of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and he had challenging relationships with his own sons. Fred had to work hard at being calm and loving others. He knew it takes a lot of work to love your neighbor, and he did that work every day. And of course, he knows it takes a lot of work to love yourself. 
That's why he came back to that core message again and again. For Mr. Rogers, love wasn't a fluffy feeling of hearts and flowers. He said, love isn't a state of perfect caring. Love is an active noun like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way they are right here and now. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way they are right here and now. Even when that person is ourselves. Amen. community, 
we know the power of connecting our hearts with God's presence. So during this time, we share all of our joys and concerns in prayer. For those of you joining us through Zoom or Facebook, you're invited to add your joys and concerns into the chat box. Those of you in the room are invited to share them aloud, just a reminder that out of respect for confidentiality, we don't use last names. We begin with joys. What joys do you bring to this place today? Mary. Um, Colin turned seven, our grandson Colin turned seven this past week. We celebrate that, but also he had his party in the community center yesterday, and I just want to celebrate the of that space. And how wonderful it was for a seven-year-old crazy to have a party. So it's a beautiful space. Thank you. Mary is lifting up her grandson Colin's seventh birthday, and also that his party was held in the community center, which is a great space for laps, right? You can just go around and around and around. So Mary is also celebrating the gift that that space, renovated by this congregation, is for the community, for all the, the birthdays and family events that take place over there. Thanks, Mary. Other joys. Catherine. <laughs> so Max and Leo, who we prayed for when they were being knit together in their mother's womb, turned eight. Everybody survived. And clearly, we're going to have to come up with a special package for birthday parties for young children in the community center. We will work on that. Yeah, Marley. Uh, I want to celebrate the youth. Um, I'm just looking at my granddaughter, Avery, and her brother, Owen. Uh, and for well, Avery finishing up, they've been doing Legally Blonde. She's been in that play at the high school. But just you know, the dedication and the respect for each other, mm -hmm. there is hope in the mm -hmm. world. And then Owen, he's 11, but his soccer team is going to Ireland this <gasps> week to play four or five games over in Ireland. But the reason they're going is they're such a wonderful group of boys that get together, respect, show compassion, empathy for each other and other teams. That the coach wanted to do something special with them. But you know, I think So they get to go to Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> we used to have ice cream. Yeah, Marley is lifting up the beauty and power of our young people. She's focusing on her grandchildren, but I think they are symbols of what we see in our young people. And it's really just our job to not wreck it. So particularly lifting up Avery, who has been um, in the musical Legally Blonde at, her, at the high school? Yeah, it's a junior version. Avery's in high school? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, and then Owen, who's a soccer fiend, is going to Ireland because his coach wanted to do something special. Um, which I'm not bitter, but I'm so glad for Owen that he gets that experience. And, and, it, and it's in part, we've heard about this team before, how well they, they all work together. Mr. Rogers is very proud of them. I, I have a few joys, but I don't want to step on anybody else's. Suzanne. William, Suzanne's son, is going to be 27 on Valentine's Day. Happy birthday to William and, and to you. And uh, Ralph is also going to be 27 on Valentine's Day. So we celebrate. <laughs> oh, I, I think I'm getting glared at right now. <laughs> Too bad. We celebrate you anyway. Um, Jackie C. asked for prayers after her son Stephen's back surgery. Uh, he had surgery this past week. They didn't tell her about it until the day before. He came through fine, but there's a long recovery ahead. So prayers for Steve and Jackie C's son. And Linda and Fred, who continue to deal with illnesses and accidents, just wanted me to lift up how grateful they are for the support and meals and care. So that's a joy this morning. What concerns do you bring to this place today? I have a, I have a couple on. Oh, yeah, Marley, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, watching the news with the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria this past week, 
I have to admit, I haven't been on the news this morning, but over 22,000 have lost their lives, left I read, dealing with cold, dealing with lack of shelter, dealing with conflict. Um, World Central Kitchen, which UCC Box Pro supports, and we sent another $500 donation to them this week. They were near the epicenter within two days, working to get food to people. And if you're feeling hopeless, um, I want to remind you of the idea of like, sort of caring globally and acting locally. One of the things that they're really missing in Turkey and Syria is blood. We cannot give blood in a way that's going to help Turkey and Syria, but we can give blood in a way that's going to help our community. So if you're someone who's able to give blood, maybe make that appointment this week, and that might help you feel like something you can do in the face of what the world really is. I also have Ginny, H-A-S, not that Ginny, other Ginny, in my prayers this morning. She's been going through a lot with accidents and illness, so prayers for Ginny. And uh, prayers for Lindsay Clancy and her family. Linda S. rightfully requested prayers for this woman from Duxbury in the news, along with her husband. Um, Linda's friends worked with Lindsay. The pain in this story is overwhelming but we can hold them all in prayer. I also have the concern that women who are dealing with postpartum depression will be less likely to get help due to the stigma attached to this story, so may we continue to work on honesty around mental health struggles and adequate treatment for all. Okay, so on several occasions when speaking with adults, Mr. Rogers asked them to take some time in silence to think about those who had loved them into being. Anyone who had loved the people in his audience and who had nourished them in the deepest part of their being. Now, I think he was trying to get grown-ups to tap into two things. One, the power of the great cloud of witnesses who have loved us. Those right nearby, those far away, those in sacred memory. But I think he was also trying to get us to be a bit more quiet he said, real revelation comes through silence. In silence, we can let important parts of ourselves emerge and open ourselves to the wisdom that surrounds us if we just had the heart to perceive it. So our prayer will start with a full minute of silence. I will watch the clock. You don't have to. And I give you the same invitation that Fred gave reporters and TV stars and White House experts. Think about the people who have loved you throughout your life and Feel that love anew. Let us pray. Nurturing God, we are your children, now and forever. We are never so big that we don't need your care. We will never be so grown that we don't need your comfort. We will never outgrow the need for your love. Help us to hold on to childlike wonder, to stay curious and open Spend more time in play. Send us stories and music and art that speak to and soothe our soul. Send us heroes of every age, shape, and ability to show us how to live and thrive. When the monsters under the bed and on the news frighten us. When we are ready to have tantrums out of frustration and when the questions of our lives threaten to overwhelm us, 
Hold us close. Still our spirit. Whisper to our hearts that you love us just as we are. Amen. Five families have heaped. Six families can get to medical appointments and work. Seven families had enough to eat. Eight families are in their homes tonight. In 2022, the UCC Boxborough Deacons Fund helped 25 families in our community distributing over $11,000. We paid rent, we bought groceries, we took care of car repairs, and we covered utility bills. This was one of the most tangible ways in which we loved our neighbors. So many of our neighbors are living right at the edge. An increase in prices, a brief illness, or a flat tire are enough to put a whole family at risk. So we work with schools and the town and local agencies to help not just get a bill paid, but connect people to the resources they need. Every February, we take a collection for the Deacons Fund. It's also known as the Community Support Fund. And like all connections, this is completely optional. Folks online, the Zoom Deacon will post giving information in the chat box. In person, there are special giving envelopes in your bulletin, which you can put in the plate at the back of the sanctuary. And anyone can use the text to give number in the bulletin. Just add CSF for Community Support Fund after the amount. Thank you for all the ways in which you support the ministry of UCC Boxborough. Our closing hymn is Oh for a World. The words are in your bulletin and on your screen. You're invited to rise in body or in spirit. benediction begins with one more quote from Mr. Rogers. If you could only sense how important you are to the lives of those you meet, how important you can be to the people you may never even dream of, there is something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with another person. So go, beloved, into the world, loving your neighbor and knowing you are loved.